um, they'll be referred to as that person's a lone wolf because they've done some great deals and they're off running by themselves. And it may be that they're, I don't know, they've been around longer. They kind of know more of the of the traps by themselves. They've got a you know greater level of tenure. Um, but what you often find those lone wolves have, and this, this is kind of a trick for young players, those joining joining the sales model, is they'll have that they'll have that colleague. I'll have that person they spend time with on a regular basis. Yeah, just just set yourself a goal. I mean, everyone in sales is really like numbers driven, goal driven. So literally set yourself a goal and that every week for the next three weeks, you'll catch up with three friends. And text messages don't count, voicemails don't count. You actually go and physically see them and hold space and ask a question, are you okay? And by holding space, that's, that means without judgment, it means without um, you know, pushing advice or having any agenda, it's just being there and being a good human. And make sure that one of those people you're checking in on the weekly is yourself. Welcome to Growth Pulse, the B2B sales podcast, where we take a deep dive into the world of business to business sales and how businesses can get the most out of their investment in sales people, sales systems and processes, the lifeblood of any thriving organization. Join us as we explore a range of topics as well as speak to some of the industry's thought leaders, vendors, success stories, and people who have just won and failed on their journey in business and sales. Before we get started, please do us a huge favor and click subscribe, follow or like wherever you're watching or listening to us. Also, please drop us a comment that you subscribed. We'd love to get to know our audience. This Are You OK Day, we're encouraging all Australians to create space for meaningful conversations. Asking, are you okay, how are you doing, or what's going on in your world is the first step. But genuinely listening to the answer is key. That's why it's important you're here to hear whatever comes next. Make sure you're giving your mate, your colleague, your family member or loved one the right environment to open up. You know them and they know you. You know when they feel most at ease. So take some time to think about where and how you'll be completely here to hear. Choose a time and a place where you can give your full attention, free of distractions. Create a situation where the person you're asking feels comfortable discussing difficult thoughts, feelings or emotions. And tie it into something that makes sense to you both, no matter what that is and where it takes you. From a walk in the park, a sit down over coffee or a quiet night in, you'll know when and where will be best. And remember, every day is the day to ask, are you okay? And let people in your world know you're here to really hear. Welcome back, everybody, to another edition of Growth Pulse, the B2B sales podcast. We have a special edition today going live on Are You OK Day. We have pre-recorded this session. Um, I'm Dan Bartels, one of your hosts. Uh, Simon Peterson couldn't be here today, so he doesn't give his apologies. But this is an important topic that we wanted to discuss for for all people, men, mental health, um, well-being, uh, anxiety in particular. We have a very special guest to join us today, uh, Bronwyn Penhaligon. Uh, she's a strategic psychotherapist and uh, specialising in anxiety. So, Bronwyn, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Delightful to be here. So thankful. You know, you reached out to to have a discussion about um, mental health and you know workplace anxiety, etc. Uh, which being a salesperson myself, I've been I spent my entire career in sales and my wife is a kindergarten teacher and I think her role would generate enormous levels of anxiety for me and she thinks the reverse for myself. But obviously, we're, you know, we're, we're focusing on our audience today and, and most of our audience are, you know, salespeople or, or entrepreneurs and business professionals and existing in that space can generate a, a huge level of, of anxiety, ups and downs of of the business world and and you know revenue creation um you know is that something you touch on regularly in in your practice and you know any i suppose starting off you know how do we think about those areas yeah yeah absolutely look it is it's a major major issue i think um and particularly we we know right the, the facts show us that anxiety is the precursor to depression essentially yeah. so that that's why i guess i i reached out to you because i i know that with are you okay day the the core focus there is really on looking at the people that have struggling and have gone down that slippery slope into sitting with their black dog. Um, But I think that also as it relates to workplace and particularly in the world of sales, the anxiety piece is, um, is huge, right? I mean, those, those ups and downs that are happening constantly and the pressure that is just relentless 
and the sheer fact that sure you can finish a really strong month but then you go to sleep and you wake up and you're on zero and you've got to start again yeah like it's that's a lot it's a pretty hectic merry-go-round to be stuck on yeah i think it's a it's a, a real challenge that uh, a lot of people avoid uh getting into sales or, or or having a revenue creation style role um because of exactly that roller coaster and you know feeling that pressure of how do i their own perception of how do I get someone to the end of a transaction? I, you know, I feel like I've, I've pushed them to make a decision. Uh, mm. Great, we've celebrated that, but was it in their was it in their best interest? And I think you know one of the pieces of advice that I have as a sales leader and a salesperson is you fundamentally can't make the decision for anybody else. Um, you know, so actually settling into that position of you know we create solutions for customers that they can step into. You can't actually force anybody to do anything. And I think I've given this advice a few times on the podcast. Um, and I'm, I, my wife doesn't listen all that much. She's a school teacher, but um, <laughs> you know, I can't convince her to do anything she does not really want to do. I can't want to get a dog. We want to go on holidays. You know, we want to buy a new house. If she doesn't want to do it. You know, it's a, she's, a, she's an adult. She'll say, we, I don't want to do that. Um, whereas, and you know, vice versa her to me. And I think that's a, a key piece as salespeople that, you have, people moving into sales have to get really comfortable with. We help facilitate that process. By all means, we speed it along and, you know, we help customers make good decisions, but it isn't our decision at the end of the day and kind of giving yourself that breathing space to understand you won't, you know, you will lose more than you win. It's a really important lesson. Do you see that in your practice? Oh, absolutely. All the time. Look, the number one reason why people come into clinic is because they've got what we call an external locus of control. So okay. I know it sounds really fancy, but it basically just means that, you know, it, when you think about the concept of control, right, you've either got, um, you know, an internal space where you feel that you're in control of your life. You're essentially in the driver's seat. You're the one that makes the decisions. You're the one that responds to what happens that's when you're in a really healthy space. That's yeah. when you're feeling really good. When people come into clinic, they're not in that space. They're the complete opposite. So they're running an external locus of control. And what that means is they're kind of like the kid in the back seat, like just flipping through their phone. Like they don't really know where they're going. They're not really all that involved and they're certainly not in charge. So instead of being proactive and actually feeling like they're driving decisions, they're more reactive and stuff's happening to them. So you'll hear things like, oh, he, you know, he made me mad or the traffic's the reason why I'm late as opposed to actually taking the responsibility and the control of being what's happening in their lives. Yeah, and I think for salespeople, the way that often often shows up mm -hmm. is, you know, going through it, an individual deal cycle, um, how do you take control of the way a deal is occurring? And, you know, my, my advice mm -hmm. in that scenario is understanding, again, while I can't make the decision, I can absolutely control... Uh, the environment in which we're all talking about a deal or about a transaction mm -hmm. or solving a problem. Um, and if I'm left, uh, it's in that, that concept of external locus of control, mm -hmm. if I'm left as a passenger in that process where uh, I'm not in control of the next meeting cycle or time or the agenda, um, I don't have a good plan around what's about to go and happen, then, mm -hmm. then I'm, I'm a passenger in that experience and I've got yeah. my business or colleagues asking me, you know, and they may be trying to help me on a deal, asking me about what's going on and I'm a passenger. So I who's know. driving the conversations is, is external to me and now that, that can only serve to increase my anxiety around are we going to get there? Am I wasting people's time? Am I going to have pressure coming towards me? And I think that's a really good uh, frame of reference to think about it are are we in control or is somebody else in control of what's going on in this particular example is that how i should think about it well yeah you're definitely on the right track there dan i mean like the idea of control right and this is the real pivot point like when you think about you know the seesaw this is the fulcrum bit in the middle yeah. like the pivot point is to recognize and appreciate that you're not actually in control of anything outside of yourself well that's a bit scary 100% emphatically yeah. not, not a thing. You can influence, yes, yes, you can influence, but in, influence is not control. Yeah. So when you think about the sales process, you can hear what your client's saying, you can answer everything they've put in the brief, you can put in all the extra bits that you know that they asked for, plus a couple of sweeteners, you can do all the due diligence and, you know, make it, you know, tie it up with a bow. But yeah. pretty much as soon as you hit send and it goes out, it's 
totally out of your hands. You don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. It's totally yeah. ambiguous after that. And that's the part that people kind of get stuck on, right? Because yeah. they get really fixated on the outcome and they get really stressed out about like, oh my gosh, what could happen? What could I have said better? Or what could I have done more of, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then they go down the path of rumination. That's when they're staying awake all night, thinking about their mm. day over and over and over. Then the sleep cycle yep. gets affected. Then they wake up, feel like shit. Then they're not productive. And guess what? Same deal tomorrow. Yeah. So one of the ways that I've always, you know, and look, I, I'd be the first to say, um, you know, you absolutely will go through ups and downs in being in sales, in, in a sales role. And I think in any role you go through yeah. ups and downs. You know, this is not a unique problem to, to people who are in sales. Um, but, you know, there's, I found if I control what I can control or if I, if I have control of what I'm going to influence, then, then my anxiety is significantly less mm. over time. And even if sometimes, you know, those, uh, those engagements, um, sometimes it's not just doing a deal, sometimes it's solving a problem or, or someone making a hard decision. Um, if I've controlled genuinely all the things that it's possible to control, I'm okay with the outcome. I'm okay with the negative outcome occurring. Um, and often the negative outcome is a no or a customer treating or leaving or that, you know, that difficult conversation with your internal leadership saying, you know, that thing we planned for didn't happen. But if you've done everything that you can possibly do and you've planned for it and you've known that, anxiety really dissipates. Yeah, is, that unique to, is that unique to me or is that kind of part yeah. of the, the process? No, that's, that's again, absolutely it, right? Because the reason we get anxious and the reason we get that kind of fluttery feeling and we're like, you know, oh, shit, is because we're being driven to do something. We need okay. to take action. And as soon as you start taking action, you start to feel better and you start to do better. It's when you get stuck up in your head, that's when you do yourself a mischief. Yeah, right. And what about what about when we take action, but it's not productive action? So it's not necessarily that I'm I'm doing myself harm, but it's mm. it's I know that I've taken action, but the action has ended up increasing my anxiety. How do I sort of think about those like those scenarios as well? So there's a difference, right, between rumination and reflection. Right. Yeah. So I mean, we're such creative human beings, like the yep. amount of stuff that we can fantasize and create in our minds is pretty amazing. And yep. so you create all of your problems. Right. Essentially, it's you're just believing your own bullshit. That's why you get caught caught up. But yep. that means you can also imagine your own solutions. Yeah. So if you start imagining a solution and you're going down a path with it and you take action and then you realize that, oh, actually, this is making it worse. It's just like, bro, just pull up, just pause recalibrate, take a breath, try something else. I think, you know, sometimes people will make decisions and they feel like, um, you know, it's been set in concrete and Rio, you know, like mm. but really being able to pivot and to make some amends and to change is, is totally okay. Yep. It's absolutely okay. And moreover, when you're working with a client and if you're going a certain path down, um, you know, working with them and you're, providing the solution you can feel that it's going a bit wonky to actually just call it out and be like it doesn't seem like this is resonating or how about we look at this in a different way or you know etc cetera, etc cetera. but just basically own what you can feel is going on because most of the time you know there's going to be something in that I mean we, we yeah. get feelings and responses for a reason right yeah right I mean I think that ownership piece um can be difficult for many people, right? So actually mm. owning uh, the scenario that they're in. I mean, I know I've been, been in that scenario before where, you know, things aren't going the way that you wanted them to go and actually taking responsibility for yeah. where we are, but also then the actions moving forward. That can be scary. Um, that can be daunting to people. I, I know it's been daunting to me at different stages, but I mm. think... You know, and, and again, I'm intrigued in turn at kind of the advice you give to your your clients. My experience has been the hardest step is always the first one. Um, yeah. and, and some direct direction in any movement in any direction is actually mm. often a massive part of the resolution of the anxiety that you're in. Just start the movement and and how you mm. can course correct along the way, but you know inertia in when, once you're anxious inertia can be can be the the biggest hurdle is, is that um you know what you see in, in your practice as well 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of the time, yeah, people do come in and they're just feeling really stuck, right? They've yeah. either got so many options that they don't know which one to take. And so they yeah. have trouble being able to um, do a solid risk assessment and, you know, kind of feel comfortable in decision making. So they're like, fuck, it's too hard. I just won't do anything. Yep, fair or, enough. Yeah, or it's the other way around where they're like, I feel so stuck. I don't know what to do. So, you know, maybe I just like, just keep thinking about it. And that's, yeah. that's also not helpful either. Again, like you can, you could reflect and have a review of your day and be like, okay, cool. I know that I screwed up that, um, you know, phone call earlier. I yep. probably yep. should have led with, you know, a softer tone. And then as long as you're taking action, that's cool. That's totally fine. Yep. But if you're just going over and over and over with no action or no new information, again, that's when you start hurting yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So I know part of a big part of our you okay day, which is obviously the, the purpose of this this session, is not just about ourselves individually. And while you know, I, I genuinely put the message out there to you know all of our listeners and, and all of my colleagues and friends, you know, hear the message: Are you okay? Um, you know, an important part of the day is actually about having the the uh, strength, the interpersonal strength, and the openness go to ask your your colleagues and and friends like are you okay because too often people don't actually open up that 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 piece of communication with each other to check in and make sure people when they're struggling feel like they can be supported so what advice can you give to our listeners around how do they have that conversation with others because it isn't an easy one um you know how can they approach that conversation yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's it's interesting, right? The theme of this year is let people know you're here to hear them. So there's kind of, you know, two different spellings of the word yeah. here and there, which is kind of cute. But really, they they um, the guys at Are You OK Day have made some great resources, um, which I absolutely you know, hold testament to. But it's really just creating space and holding space for people. Yep. A lot of the reason why um, we don't ask is because we're like, well, shit, like, what am I going to say if they say, no, I'm not OK? Like, how yeah. do I deal with that? Like, what if I hear something really scary? I won't be able to fix that. Yeah. And it's actually a really good thing to remind yourself, it's not your job to fix them. You yeah. don't need to do anything. All you need to do is just create an environment where, you know, there's a feeling of trust, yep. um, where you're free of distractions and you approach it from a really authentic space and literally just ask, do some active listening, um, encourage the person to take action because, again, we all get stuck in our heads and we get a little bit in that comfort zone and sometimes mm. the comfort zone is just having a good bitch about it and not actually yeah. doing anything. Yeah. That doesn't really help. Um, but then once you've encouraged that action, then to also uh, check in with the person as well. So follow yeah. up with them and be like, how are you going with this? Do you need support with that? Um, and be a bit of a cheerleader, I suppose. Yeah, I think it's it's a... An evolution of the way we communicate today as well you know mm. so much of our communication ends up back in social media even with some of your best friends yeah. and and you know the frequency of which we can contact people while it seems to be we know their lives because we're watching them on you know yeah. facebook and TikTok and instagram and whatever else because we've got that kind of surface level connection we, mm. we don't reach out often enough and genuinely sort of get below the surface and hey look mm. i know you put this great post out but Hey, are you okay over there? Like, is everything is everything good? I mean, um, you know, share some personal stories here. I had a, um, a guy I grew up with who unfortunately passed away not too many months ago, and and my uh, my colleagues and my friends and I from school were together, and we said, look, we, one of the things we don't do is just get together enough, yeah. as especially as as men, um, mm. we don't make that space to say, hey, we're gonna go out and have a beer because we need to, yeah. you know, the ten as many of us can get together on a regular basis, so. As a result, we've made we've made a fictitious sports club. <laughs> There's no sport being played, awesome. um, but it's Good. given us a way to actually like drive connection with each mm. other. And once a quarter, we organise the the quarterly meeting, <laughs> and, nice. and we've got one coming up shortly. But it was a, and we actually look. I can't say we take ownership of it. And one of our one of our friends' brothers has one already. They've got a fishing club. Ours is a badminton mm. club, right? And and it's it's all about just getting people to get together to have those conversations. And I think mm. too often, you know, you might shoot a text message and someone texts you back, but you don't actually have that genuine conversation. Just saying, you know, hey, how are things going? And I know, you know, in the software world that I've come from, uh, mm. that I'm in still today, um, it's been a tough 
couple of years. Yeah, it is so massive. And again, regardless of which stage in career you're at, yeah. we're always doing this thing. I put I put a post up about this last week, I think, um, on LinkedIn, where we run comparisons, right? Yeah. And one of the um, the people I was working with that was running comparison really, ba- really, really badly, it's massively hurting himself. He yeah. was telling me that he's totally cool to get up in front of a room of 300 people and take a lectern. That's cool. doesn't worry him at all. But seeing his close friends at a barbecue on the weekend, that's yeah, when he no. runs anxiety because yeah. he's like, this guy's more advanced than I am. This guy's further along in his family. This guy's doing better financially. That guy just got back from an overseas trip. And he's like, and what am I doing? I, you know, I'm still here and I'm still grinding. And so it's like, if you're going to compare yourself, right, you need to compare yourself to the full gamut of the human experience in your mm. vertical. So say if you're in, new in sales and you've been in there three months and you're only just starting to find your feet and get a rhythm going, but you're comparing yourself to the dude that's been doing it for 10 years, it's hardly fair, right? You, if you're going to compare yourself, you need to look at the whole thing, which includes that person that hasn't even started yet because they're too scared, right? So yep. you're actually a bit more advanced than they are. Yeah, for sure. And then I, and the, the other part of the comparison piece, uh, which is important to you know land on, is the only person whose life you really know of what's going on is yours. Yeah. So if you're going to compare yourself, the only person that it's actually valid to compare yourself to is the earlier previous version of you. Yeah. So where yep. were you a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago? And have you made progress since then? Yeah. Look, I did a course um, a number of years ago now. And one of the, it was one of the big insights that they actually kind of led you towards, which was we all sat in a room and closed our eyes and they took us through this whole story and, and developed a level of anxiety around um, mm. what was going to happen. And then they brought us, without opening our eyes, brought us back to the room and said, hey, you've got anxiety about what, what might happen now to you but there are a hundred people in this room and every single one of them has anxiety about what's going to happen to them. Mm. They're not thinking about you. <laughs> and, and, and it was actually a real aha moment for me, which was like, it's not, they don't care about me. It wasn't that they, um, you know, would, would do me harm, but they're focused mm. on their well being and themselves. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and when you're in sales, I think a hard piece is I always try to use the reference of we're performance athletes we're asked to perform and deliver month in, month out. You know, if you deliver a donut, you deliver zero dollars for a period, like someone's going to come up and say, listen, the only thing that you produce is revenue. If you're not producing those things, I kind of can't afford to keep you. Mm. And everybody in sales is always trying for the next bigger deal, the next engagement. You're always trying to grow, just sell more. At mm. some point, if you really engage that type of lifestyle, you're going to a push to a you're going to push to a point where, hey, it didn't work. You're in the wrong team. You're in the wrong role. You got a bad territory. Your product's not great. Whatever the story is, mm-hmm. stuff is going on in your life, and you're going to get traded. You know, if you look at if you take the the sporting analogy again, like great players get traded between teams on a regular basis, and it's got nothing to do with them. Mm-hmm. So taking that that mentality, and I've I've coached a number of people through this over time, which is. When did you get traded? Like, when did it not work mm. out? Because I want to know that you've got the the tiger stripes on on your back around, hey, this didn't work and you've learned from that. But yeah. being able to be vulnerable and say, hey, listen, I haven't succeeded all the time mm. because you haven't, nobody has. Mm. Um, and and what, did you, what did you learn from those scenarios? So I think in sales, being honest to say, I've pushed hard enough that I've taken mm. the risk, but I failed and I learned from the failure and I've, and I've gone again, like that's when people are really robust in terms of what they bring to a team, what you can learn mm-hmm. from. Um, I think yeah, it's a really critical piece of, of learning and evolving in your career um, and, and looking, you know, how do you get ro- that resilience and robustness? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, particularly in the, the software space, as you touched on before, it's yeah. all about test and learn, right? Yeah. It, it's like fail, fail fast right? Yep. You just get in there, you have a hustle, give it a crack. If it's not working, that's cool. Pivot, next, yep. next job. Like it's all good. And I think also a lot of um, workplaces, you know, need to have that environment where they're actually encouraging or supporting failure. 
obviously yeah. within limits of, you know, the fiscal situation, yeah. 100%, but you need to have a space where you've got psychological safety, right? Yeah. Where it's not just a physically safe environment where you're not going to get electrocuted, but it's also yeah. an emotionally, psychologically safe environment too, so that you actually can feel free to say, hey, I'm struggling. I've got, I'm waving my white flag. I've been working on this account. Yeah three months, I'm really not making it in inroads, someone else needs to have a go. It's like thinking about these sports yep. analogies, I think is really, really helpful, particularly in teams, right? When you think of a, um, like a relay race, they're the yes. top four performers um, yep. from your, your sprint runs. And then they're strategically placed of who starts the relay and then who finishes. Yep, finishes and then yep. there's a couple of dudes in the middle, right? I was always number two or three. I wasn't <laughs> never fast yep. enough. But um, I think that it's it's important to think about that, that it's okay to pass the baton because yes. you're a team and, yep. you're, and you're working together. Another one that I really like thinking about the sports stuff and just leaning into that for a sec is Sometimes when you get given a new space or a new job or a new piece of work um, and it feels big and heavy and hard, maybe it's a new CRM system you've got to learn or maybe it's a whole bunch of new stuff, skills that you're supposed to develop and you sit around you bitch and grizzle about it because it's this big heavy lift and you've got to learn all yep. this new yep. shit that you don't want to do. It's like, okay, cool. So when you go to the gym and you're picking up the weights and they feel heavy, do you then just sit around and have a cry about that? Probably yes. not, right? Yep. Because that's why you're there, to lift yep. heavy stuff, to get stronger and to stretch yourself. And if it actually feels too easy, then you load it up and you make it heavier. Yeah. So yep. it's like if you're going to like actually be in a space where you want to grow and push, then yep. you need to experience a discomfort and you need to yep. accept it and embrace it and actually really create it and love the crap out of it because otherwise you're not growing and you're not pushing. Yeah. And I think in that, in that analogy as well, I mean, I, I spend a fair bit at the gym. I'm a amateur weightlifter on the side for all the things that I do. But, you know, we at our gym spend a lot of time talking about um, my heavy isn't your heavy. No, and no. you'll be great at some things that I'm not great at. And understanding our own limitations of where we are today doesn't mean we can't get to where we want to get to. But being really okay with knowing that what I'm working on is hard for me right now. Yeah. Um, but also being willing to call out when you know one of your you know, one of your colleagues in the gym, your friends in the gym, that's not hard for them. And they're not kind of having a go at the moment. But, hey, what's going on for you? Yeah. Are you injured? Injury we've got to deal with. We've got to manage that well, the same as you do in your working career. Look, yeah. you know, I'm just, my demos have not worked for the last couple of months. I'm taking a little, you know, detour to get those right and kind of simplifying them down so I can build them up again. Or, mm -hmm. you know, my prospecting is not working. But, you know, make sure that those things are working for you well. Um, but, perform to the level that you know you can perform to and you know just not putting in the right amount of effort at the right time doesn't work either when you've got that capacity because you've often been given responsibility for accounts or customers or opportunities you need to look at and others are relying on you to perform at that level and and you know when it's not working not putting your hand up and saying hey listen i need some help which is again what are you okay day is all about mm -hmm. um I, that can be on you, but it can also be on those around you to reach out and say, hey, listen, are you okay? Yeah. Looks like It looks like you're not getting it right there. And I know we've got a really collaborative, you know, conversation in our gym around sometimes people just need that little bit of a tweak to get back into, yeah. into the right movement so that they can have an impact in what, in what in, you know, a, a significant impact in, in their output and their outcome. Um, I mean, you know, sales is a, is a challenging pastime career <laughs> career you know dedication where you will lose more than you win mm. um you know i'd love to talk a bit more about that in terms of you know how do we as salespeople or or entrepreneurs mm. really get comfortable with that scenario of of we lose more than we win just circling back to what you were talking about when you notice that one of your your mates or your comrades isn't you know performing as well sometimes what people need is just a running mate right yeah just need someone to just you know fall into line with them for a little bit and give them that extra bit of support because again sales yep. is a pretty lonely road particularly when yep. you're you're pushing for that top echelon like you don't really want to tell everyone what you're doing until it gets pretty close to end of month and then you're just like ha, yeah. ha, another moment so but it's a long hard like lonely road absolutely yeah, I think I, do you know, on that as well, I, often we hear the terminology and you may not be across this called lone wolf. 
So mm -hmm. you often see someone in the sales team, um, they'll be referred to as that person's a lone wolf because they've done some great deals and they're off running yeah. by themselves. And it may be that they're, I don't know, they've been around longer. They kind of know more of the, of the traps by themselves. They've got a you know greater level of tenure. Um, but what you often find those lone wolves have, and this, this is kind of a trick for young players as joining, joining the sales model is they'll have that, they'll have that colleague. They'll have that mm -hmm. person they spend time with on a regular basis, you know, getting advice, uh, you know, testing their ideas. Um, I've had a number in my career where we would just spend time writing on a whiteboard. Um, mm -hmm. Hey, can I grab you for half an hour? And we just draw out scenarios and we talk about problems and I've got this in this account. What are your thoughts on that? It's, and, and the number of times you'd see different ways of solving a problem and, and, you know, pivot because you just did, you couldn't see the forest for the trees. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a critical and crucial part of that, but it's also the same person that, um, and in fact, I've got a couple of them who, who are, as I've been kind of moving around roles in the last period, have been some of my biggest fans and, and boosting me up. And I, I can't thank them enough um, mm -hmm. because it's, it gives you that confidence back that you know what you're doing and you right, it's time yeah. to go again and, and let's pick up you know, let's pick up the uh, the yoke and pull. Um, mm -hmm. but I think you're hundred percent right. It really is that piece of you know having that open communication with people as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, you know, you just you don't want to feel alone. There's a big difference between being alone and being lonely, right? Yes. Huge difference in that. And I think, you know, when when it comes to being comfortable with having all of those metaphysical like punches in the face of people yeah. saying no to you and the rejection piece, like when, when that's your life and if you're not quite new, you know, comfortable with that yet, cause you're new to industry, then you need, you absolutely need to have a team around you that keeps yeah. popping you up and keeps saying, bro, it's just about the numbers. Just keep pushing, keep hustling. Every yeah. time you hear a no, you're just another step closer to a yes. You know, yeah. I know it sounds kind of a bit cliched and a bit like eye rolly, but it can get really quite brutal. And particularly, you know, sometimes people are jerks, right? I say this a lot, um, you know, because I'm trying to you know, extend my reach too, right? So constantly yeah. talking to people, talk, telling them about my clinic and what I'm doing. And everyone will say, oh, that sounds like a great idea. Let's, let's catch up and talk about that. And then you try really hard to actually make those next steps meetings happen and those conversations happen mm. and everyone's busy and the diaries are clashing and... I have, a, um, I have a rule where I, when I'm speaking to people and pitching or prospecting that I say, it is totally okay to say no to me, absolutely fine, but it's not okay to jerk me around. Yeah. Because again, okay. it's like if it's, if it's not something that aligns with what your company wants to achieve and you don't want to invest in your people in this way, that's cool. That's fine. If you've got your own thing going on, babe, you do you. But don't do that whole, yeah, maybe, or posso, or let's catch up and think about it. It's like... Yeah. Yeah. Just pick one. Yeah, and I think one of the one of the things I've coached teams on, uh, team members over time on, is is taking a customer to know is a really important mm. skill to learn. Yeah, for starters, people don't actually like to say no; they like to say yes. Um, and so, so often you'll see, and in the sales context, I want to clarify that for those listening. I say, hold on, I've got lots of customers saying no right now. No, they're not actually saying no; they're not saying anything. They're not saying yes, but they're actually not saying no. Uh, and, and when you look at sales pipelines, often you'll see this long tail of mm. smelly deals. They've been around for a long time and there's, there's a bit of inertia with a customer or waiting on this thing to happen or, mm. you know, the particular contact just left or the product wasn't quite right. They haven't made a decision with our competitor yet, but they haven't made a decision with ours. An important skill to learn is to get them to that definitive answer mm. of, actually, it's not no. Okay, so if it's not no, what are you saying? Yeah. Are you saying yes? Are you saying I need more information? Mm. Um, I need to you know, actually define these other components. Let's go and do those things. Because if it's not any of those things, let's be clear, is mm. it no? And being really okay with it's no, line through, mm. wish you the best, happy to come back and talk to you in the future. But yeah. even in getting that definitive answer, like that's a really important thing for salespeople to lower anxiety. Absolutely. Um, it's a definitive answer. We're moving on. We're going and chasing the next, you know, like the next opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's one of the biggest causes of anxiety amongst 
entrepreneurs and sales professionals, when you think there's the potential for all of these things that underneath it, you know, is not there. Yeah. And you're scared and concerned and worried about, but what if I left this opportunity that could have been there? What if I, what if I said no and walked away from it mm. rather than just saying, this isn't a, this isn't the right one for us. This mm. isn't the right one for them. The timing's not right. So, okay, great. We're going to cut it. I'm going to move on. And sometimes the timing's not good. Sometimes it means the bank means the bank manager is, is at the door, right? But at least you know what the new problem to go and solve is rather than being in this limbo land of halfway, half there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, like, I think that's a, a in my experience of being a sales, it's a, it's a crucial skill of learning to take customers to know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, again, part of our, our human condition, right, is that we're wired to look for patterns and yeah. Yeah, our brains are constantly just trying to keep us safe. And yep. the way that we're trying to keep ourselves safe is by lowering um, the ambiguity. So we, we don't like things that we don't know, right, yep. essentially. And, and that's what anxiety is. It's just a fear of the unknown. And so how do we deal with that? Well, sometimes we get really, really creative and we just start inventing all of these outcomes and situations that may or yep. may not be real. And we do lots of um, fortune telling and mind reading, which is really, um, really fun, yep. not helpful, but can be quite an interesting thing to think about. Um, but really, the best way to be able to engineer out ambiguity is just to take action, to yeah. lean into that awkward conversation and literally just get on the phone and be like, hey, I haven't heard from you for a couple of weeks. I'm just going to lean straight into this. Are, are we done here? Yeah, yeah. I think the other area of anxiety that that people often associate with sales um, is that outreach to somebody that you don't know. Yeah. Um, cold calling or developing a relationship early on, you know, it's daunting even in our personal lives. You know, mm. you ask someone out for a date for the first time, or you know, you go to a new club and want to join some friends. You start a new company and you've mm. and you've got to go around and meet your colleagues. Like that that can be really daunting for people when they when they don't have a really good picture of themselves in terms of where they are. Yeah. Um, any advice for people how to kind of deal with that type of anxiety? It really comes down to having an accurate self assessment. Right. Okay. So, and, and basically what that means is is knowing your place as it stands in, in the hierarchy of the information or sorry, the space that you're going into. Yeah. So some people, um, you know, have a really inflated sense of their own skills and their own capabilities yeah. and their skills levels are here, but their confidence is up here. And that's dangerous, right? You don't want yeah. to be that. Other people are the other way around, which is like the imposter syndrome stuff that pops up where they've got yeah. these mad skills, but they think that they're pretty shit. Where you actually want to be is just a little bit shy of your skill level so that you're constantly still pushing and striving and open to new opportunities and open to you know, having a growth mindset. That's the best kind of space to be in. But when it comes to, you know, going into those new environments, and again, this this pops up for people all the time, particularly when they have to start doing networking for the first yep. time, yep. going into those big rooms with, you know, a bunch of business cards stuffed in their pants and they're like far out what am I going to do? It's just taking a moment to recognize that every single person in that room has been in the exact position you're in right now. Yes. They've all started at that space. And also, again, leaning into it and acknowledging it. The best thing you can do when you're opening conversation, if you feel nervous, is say, I'm actually feeling a bit nervous right now, but this is really important. So I'm going to keep going. And yeah. because then also not only are you recognize it in yourself, which means you're disempowering it because you're labeling it and calling it out, but it also means you're setting expectation for the other person. So yeah. if you're a bit sweaty and you're a bit bumbly and you don't quite know what you're saying, they're going to be like, oh, that's cool. She said she was a bit nervous. So I'll just yeah. make it easy. I've been in that space too. I recognize that. Yeah. I think the other thing, particularly in that networking environment is, is to understand that quite often the people that you're going to talk to are just as anxious as you are <laughs> That's because somebody's got a, a, a really Sorry. high title. Um, look, one of, one of my good friends, and, I, and I, I, I won't name what company she works for, but it's worked for some really senior organizations. Um, like, you know, I'm talking ASX, like 10 level um, organizations in very senior roles. Um, when, when I talk to her, like she's, I've got to go and present at this particular conference and I'm really concerned about it. And, 
she does it all the time. Mm. And, you know, she, she, she can display when you're talking to her a level that I, I was quite taken aback by in terms of, I thought this would just be taken in your stride. Um, and, and still gets, you know, she moves roles. She's a little bit nervous about what people are going to think about mm. her. And, and it's all the things that I experience in, in my roles. So I think like understanding that the person that you're going to go and talk to just a person um, they've got just as much, you know, self, you know, self image challenges that you might have, or again, they started where you started. Um, you know, often if you can build that kind of, uh, middle ground between the fact that mm. you, you may have something in common or maybe mm. the fact that you have nothing in common is what you've got in common, right? Yeah. Just how do you open that conversation with them? And then, you know, progress from there as two humans, I think is a really important part of not just what great salespeople do, but people who are, you know, just great humans are really good at building that that piece and, and acknowledging when you're not good at those things as well. Yeah, yeah. It's all about being authentic, right? Yeah. And again, that's that's what I really like about the theme of this year's Are You OK Day. It's it's not about, you know, creating a time and, you know, on Tuesday yeah. at 11 o'clock, we're going to have yeah. this chat. It's, like, it's not about actually, cupcakes, right? It's about, <laughs> about having conversations, yeah. It's actually just recognizing when there's a need, when you can see that someone's, you know, a little bit wobbly yeah. um, and just going in in a really authentic way and just being like, hey, how are you doing? And also sometimes that's just checking in with yourself as well, yeah. right? Yeah. And just reviewing where you're at and how you're feeling and if you need to make changes. It's interesting. I was having this chat with um, uh, another person in the industry last week about the idea of self-care and self-love. Yeah. And um, she said, oh, would you give a presentation on that? And I tried really hard to roll my eyes quietly because I'm like, man, like it's a male audience in the financial services industry. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we're not going to get anyone RSVP for that one because um, self-care, self-love doesn't really like that doesn't really nail it. Right. But sometimes, you know, thinking about the concept of it, if you can pull it back a little bit, it's like what if you reframe self-care to be more around progress and yeah. like how much progress are you making and what do you need to progress to the next step? Because really that's all you need to do. A lot of times when people get stuck and they feel like shit and they get caught, caught up in their heads, they think there needs to be this massive 180 to start doing better yeah. and feeling better. Yeah. It's not true. You only need to make a step and just another step after that. Yes. So it's about thinking from a self-care perspective, what do I need right now to keep progressing? And yeah. maybe that is just you need to just go for a run. Maybe it's you need to put fresh sheets on your bed. Maybe it's yeah. you just need to have a, you know, catch up with your mentor and get a bit of a kick in the pants so that you can work your pipeline a bit harder because you're a bit worried about the end of month for schools. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's what does progress look like as yeah. opposed to, you know, shall we run a bubble bath and, um, you know, get a novel? <laughs> Yeah. Well, look, I, I saw, I, I love your opinion on this. I saw a, um, a report the other day that said the, um, and if I could find out, I'll, I'll put a link in the comments, but uh, exercise supposedly has a greater impact on uh, mental health than any of the drugs that are available mm. or prescribed by, by the medical fraternity. Yeah. And, you know, so one of the pieces of advice, I'm sure it was the, the American or the Australian AMA were pushing out saying, you know, in order to solve anxiety and a lot of the areas of depression, it's it's be physically active. Yes. And, you know, for so long, companies of or many companies will support employees with a gym membership, et cetera. What they don't mm -hmm. often do is make that space that says, hey, it's the middle of the day, get outside at the office and go for a walk. Like, yeah. You know, hey, guys, for your lunch break, don't sit in the room we've got here, like go down the road and come back and mm -hmm have that physical movement which i think is you know we've got very sedentary lives now I mean, i'm sitting in a, in a home office and you know i haven't moved more than 100 meters from from my home today um and that's not great and it's important i went to go to the gym this morning actually but it, it's it's having that movement is is so important for humans and i think mm -hmm. we don't build that as part of our structure into what needs to be done and and maybe that's part of the conversation we need to ha have with our colleagues is Hey, are you okay? I've got your desk. I've got your line for 15. Go and have a walk. Come back. Yeah, yeah. Head right. Get some sun. Get some vitamin D. Um, I think that's a really important part of what we need to be doing as humans. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. I, I try really hard to start every day with, you know, a good 20 or 30 minutes of outside walking with my dogs. Um, yep. without No headphones, no mobile phone, just 
me and the animals out there breathing the air, hearing the birds, you know, smelling the smells, doing all the things. Yeah. And I swear to God, the days that I don't do that are so much harder. They feel like just more of a grind than the days that I do. And literally there's brain science that supports this, right? If you actually spend the first 20 minutes of your awake day with your heart rate just around 120 beats per minute, you'll get up to 20 hours of increased neural function. Wow. It's a pretty good ROI. Yeah, like 20 minutes at 120 beats per minute. So we're not talking hit classes or anything hectic. It's literally oh, just, you know, brisk walk. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe a few squats if you're into that. And, um, and yeah, you get like mad returns on it. It's really, really good. And now that, you know, we're almost into springtime, it's, um, yeah, definitely yeah. worth giving a go. We're more incentive. Get out, enjoy the outdoors. Um, and the other side of that, I mean, we're both dog owners. I can't recommend to anybody enough own a dog. <laughs> there, is, there, is, there, is, there are very few things of, you know, other animals can be similar, but I find dogs are just uh, unique in, in their in, in relationship with you. You know, you treat them well, you come home and there's, there is a, a certain piece of love of a, a, another entity that just is always so excited to see you, just Absolutely. wants to be with you all the time. And that is, is a, I think, a really important piece for, for anyone's, you know, strong mental health and how you deal yeah. with those things. So, look, we're, uh, we're getting kind of close to the, the top of the hour and I, I do want to make sure that we... Um, you know, give people some some actionable things to come out mm -hmm. of our our session at our time today. Um, we've talked about a whole bunch of different elements of of you know, are you okay day? And I think you know one of the key actions is look, make the time, reach out, yeah. talk to some people. Um, but I, you know, you're the expert. I really do want to. You know, what what advice? What actions can we can we you know encourage our our listeners to take today on are you okay day um, to to get the most out of it? Yeah, just, just set yourself a goal. I mean, everyone in sales is really like numbers driven, goal driven. So literally set yourself a goal and that every week for the next three weeks, you'll catch up with three friends. Yeah. And text messages don't count. Voicemails don't count. You actually go and physically see them and hold space and ask the question, are you okay? And by holding space, that's, that means without judgment. It means without, um, you know, pushing advice or having any agenda. It's just being there and being a good human and make sure that one of those people you're checking in on the weekly is yourself. Yeah. Well, maybe we can make it a part of a challenge. If, if our listeners have, uh, have you know, taken that up, made that call to, to one or two colleagues, look, please, you know, uh, and organize that time, not just made it a text, et cetera. Um, look, please drop a comment into the, uh, the post uh, either or the, the, the podcast or the, the post where you're seeing the, the, the video that you've actually done that. I think spreading the word and encouraging others that this is an important thing that we've done uh, is definitely the, the direction and the message of Are You OK Day. And it doesn't need to wait for an Are You OK Day. It's something we should really mm. make part of our, 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 our regular lives and our, our relationships with with our friends and colleagues around us and family as well. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I will kind of wrap up the call in, in my 11 year old daughter reminds me on a regular basis when she'll come home and it'll be a school day or a dancing or a water polo day, whatever she's playing and, and she wants to complain and I'll try and solve it. And she's very, very good at saying, dad, I don't want you to solve this. I just want to share the story with you and get it off my chest. Um, and I'm and I'm constantly reminded that that's such a really important part of like how people you know communicate, share you know problem mm -hmm. shared is problem halved. Um, yeah. So Bronwyn, I can't thank you enough for coming on the podcast. I'm sure all of our listeners have learned a lot. Um, I know I have. So mm -hmm. it is Are You OK Day. Please reach out. We've challenged you. If you've loved the video, um, look, please like and subscribe down below. If you're watching on YouTube, if you're listening to us on uh, Apple or Spotify, please give us five stars and drop a comment and subscribe. Uh, we'd love to know more about our listeners. But Bronwyn, thank you so much for joining and to all of our very, listeners. Very, very welcome. Have a great if, um, day. Last comments, if I can put yep. them in there. If, if there is someone that when you're catching up and maybe it is you're catching up with yourself and you know you do have a serious concern for that friend or colleague, um, Lifeline's always available 24-7. The number is 13 11 14. So that facility is always there. But if there is someone that is you know falling down that slippery rabbit hole and um, you're genuinely concerned, please make sure that you reach out. People kill themselves when they get depressed, guys. And typically men are the ones that go to that action 
without much thought. So cannot impress enough. If there is something happening sure. and it all feels, um, you know, pretty heavy, make sure that you're um, you're getting the right kind of support to um, prevent something really terrible. Yeah, absolutely. We'll put the uh, number up on the screen, but yeah, guys, yeah. do reach out. That's a great platform. And I, I, I did meant to mention that before we wrapped up. So <laughs> I'm glad you I'm glad you called that before we wrapped up. Look, everyone, thank you so much for the uh, for joining. Um, again, like, subscribe, uh, reach out, um, call Lifeline if you need to, and you know, do reach out to your colleagues and friends and have a great, are you okay day? Take care. Thanks all. Bye. Thanks. In life, we're stronger together. Just like good friends, your support can make all the difference as we face life's challenges together. These challenges may include exam stress, financial worries, mental health, and relationship issues. We all want to be there for our friends in tough times, but sometimes we're not sure how. That's why we've created these resources to help you become a better friend and have those important conversations. Start by spotting the signs. If something feels off with a friend, trust your instincts and ask, are you okay? It's not always easy for someone to ask for help, so be their supportive ally. We've also compiled eight articles with practical tips to help you support your friends. Whether they're dealing with exam stress, uncertainty about the future, financial troubles, low self-esteem, motivation challenges, relationship issues, mental health concerns, or loneliness. And remember, it's all a part of the Are You OK? campaign leading up to Are You OK? Day, a day dedicated to encouraging these conversations and checking in on your loved ones. If you need immediate support, you can talk to a Lifeline Crisis Supporter 24 7 by calling 13 11 14. Let's make a difference together. Learn to hash tag friend better and join us on Are You OK Day.